Anyway, next week we have to, we are going to host Laura Waller from UC Berkeley, who will acquaint us with gigapixel microscopy. Today I have the privilege of introducing to you Kate Isaacs from UC, Berkeley, UC Davis, who's going to help us visualize parallel computing. Let's welcome our speaker. introduction and thank you so much for, for coming to my talk, having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk about, as you said, how we use visualization and how we advance visualization to better understand parallel computing. And when I say parallel computing, I'm going to talk about a certain class of parallel computing, basically the big, big supercomputing that we do to do big science simulations. So this is used widely across science, climate change, medicine, molecular dynamics, airflow over airplanes, these kinds of things, then this helps us understand the science better so that we can gear the harder experiments um, and use our resources more effectively. Now, in particular, what I'm interested in doing is improving the performance of these applications. And by performance, I mean I want any particular simulation or one of the like big mathematical libraries that's underneath them, I want those to run faster. And there are several reasons why this is really important that we get good performance out of these applications. One, like these are shared machines. There are only so many machines like these in the world. They're really, really huge and not anybody can just monopolize them. We have to share. So if we get one application to run faster, that means we can get a whole bunch of other science onto the machine faster to get it running as well. So this lets us do more science. On the other hand, if we can make one application run faster, we can then make that application bigger and better. So we can make the simulation take up more space in time. So if we're looking at, say, one molecule with maybe 50 atoms, maybe we can extend so now we can deal with 100 atoms. Or we can make our um, parallel simulations more fine-grained and more accurate. So we can decrease that, that bit that we're losing by discretization and make things more continuous. So, or finally, we can actually add extra things to our model. So if you have a climate simulation, you have a cloud model, an ocean model, like the land model, the tree model, we can maybe add some of these secondary effects and show even more so that, that what we're seeing is consistent. And in many cases, this idea of making our simulation bigger and better so we can do better science is gonna be an issue of feasibility. Because though I can build a much bigger machine, and I can try to run the simulation with a lot more detail or in a lot bigger area, I have some overhead that I have to pay for for this parallelization. There has to be some way that, that all of these things interact together. And that overhead is going to cost more and more if I'm not doing things correctly. So it could be that I throw more resources out of it, but I don't actually get more science. And that's an issue of performance that we have to solve if we're really going to take advantage of these machines. So let me go a little bit more in depth about sort of what I'm thinking about when I say these kinds of parallel applications. So I might have some simulation. This is some sort of scientific thing happening. It's some mixture of, of flows. And um, I want to do it at a very fine scale. And I want it to run in a re my lifetime. So I'm going to have to parallelize it. A frequent way in which we do this is we're going to divide it up into smaller pieces. And once we have those smaller pieces, we're kind of going to think of them independently as this abstract idea of, of, in my case, processes. So each process is going to sort of own a part of that domain, and it's going to uh, do various things, run the computation, run the physics. However, there's something that's happening at these boundaries, and that data has to pass from one process to another so we can do the simulation accurately. So therefore, these processes are going to have to communicate in some way. So in this case, um, what I'm showing with the arrows is one process needs to send data to another process. And this happens quite frequently. And this communication, note, this communication is not calculating any science here. It's just part of what we need to do in order to run things in parallel. However, these processes are sort of an abstract concept that exists like wherever you're programming. This is sort of a software level idea. But in reality, these processes have to be assigned to resources on a supercomputer. So we also have the hardware to think about. So we have this chain of three kind of very complex things. What the simulation is actually doing in terms of the science. 
uh, what the code is actually doing in terms of the parallel processes, and finally, what's actually going on on that underlying network. A single arrow between the processes might be several network links of jumps. So now I have this big general question of, am I having bad performance? Could I get better performance? If so, where? Where, where in this does that happen? Uh, so the first thing I might want to do is collect some data. So let me tell you about the data that we have. Um, so on the hardware side, I can tell you how many ads we had, how many multiplies, were there cache misses uh, on those network links, how many packets came across. Um, so sometimes this is at the network level, sometimes this is more at the individual process level. Meanwhile, on the processes, that's sort of the software side. So I have software kind of ideas. I have the function calls. And then, of course, those arrows, I have the messages between them. And then on the simulation, I'm going to have something about what the simulation is actually doing. So it's temperature, it's flux. In areas of that simulation that are really, really busy, of course, we would expect that we have to do more work elsewhere. So you see, these are all interconnected. <coughs> and because it's so dependent on what you're actually running on and what scale, we're going to have to collect some of this stuff while the program is running. So this is sort of the dynamic data that we collect so that we can look at it later and figure out something about the performance that we actually observe. But there's sort of static data too that's very important. And these are things like the hardware setup that's not changing very rapidly. It is very big. It has many different elements to it. We also have other structures that you might find, like if I set up the processors in, a, say, a binary tree, I might know that ahead of time. That's not changing too much. And sort of related, I also have the source code. Because at the end of the day, one of the few things that you can actually change is your source code. So you want to know, if you find something interesting, how that relates back to the code that you're actually using. So from the visualization side, these get really complicated really fast. Because we're wanting to represent a whole bunch of different things, hundreds of thousands at once. That's more pixels than we might have in order to represent this data. On the other hand, from the performance side, I don't know where, I, where to start on this question. I can't just write a program that's going to tell me a yes or no answer because I don't know what to look at. So that's why visualization comes in, so that you can sort of explore this area. So what I'm going to do here today is talk about three cases where we solved both a visualization challenge and a performance understanding challenge together. And that's how I'm using visualization to understand parallel computing. So my first problem. How does the resource assignment affect performance? So I'm back to this idea of the processes, and they have arrows between them. They are communicating to exchange data. That's in the abstract software space. But at the same time, I'm going to have to assign them to some network. They actually have to run on real machines. But I have some choice on how I want to assign those processes to the different networks. And I want to find out, I want to understand why some work better than the other, so that I can then go into the future and start from a good place. So the data I have here is I have that communication graph between the processes. I know how heavy each of those arrows are in terms of bytes. I have the actual layout of the supercomputing network. And I'm able to count how many packets went across each. So I kind of have some, some sort of coarse-grained idea of how well it's being used. Uh, the particular network I'm going to talk about now is what's called a Taurus network. What it comes down to really, what you need to know for this talk, is it's a Cartesian grid. So we have an x direction, a y direction, a z direction. And at every grid point, like 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, there's a node with the processors on it. And then the, the links um, attach in a very Cartesian manner. This is the general, the only thing that makes this a torus is the links hang off the end and they actually come back around to the other side. But you don't need to worry about that right now. In this particular picture, uh, some of the nodes are colored in. I've just taken groups that are communicating a lot to see how they fall on the network. So that gives me a general idea of what's going on. And then I've also colored the links by how much traffic they're having. So whenever I look at this, I think, oh, OK, well, I, I think I'm seeing something, but I'm not really sure. And since this is actually interactive, I can spin it around. I can open it up and look. But I really don't get a good sense of overview. There's really too much stuff going on here. In 3D, everything is hidden, and I can't really tell what's going on. So because we really wanted to understand what's going on in these links, we came up with a projection for this network that lets us see these links much better. So what's going here on the left is if you look down this 3D grid, you can sort of imagine it as like, well, you have this inner square tube, and you have one around it and one around it. What if I just took from the middle and 
pulled that out in all directions and let the links fall down. Now this only works if I remove quite a few of the links and it also makes the ones that are going in the through direction these tiny little these tiny little diagonal links. So I can't see those anymore. So I've given up a lot of the links but I've actually really gained a lot of the links because you can see so much more on the one on the right. Like you can see that there are some links that are missing um, in that sort of tan area. I don't know if I could have found them quite as easily in this 3D view if I hadn't opened it up, made it two-dimensional, made it a lot easier to see. Of course, I picked this direction to look down, which means I made one direction, these tiny, tiny um, diagonals, and I got rid of a bunch of other links. So the choice in which direction you're going to do that matters. So we give you the ability to choose one of the directions, and we even give you this sort of mini-map that tells you, in general, what's that look like. I still have access to each of the individual links. I can still find hotspots, but I also have this nice summary of what the network was doing. And in our case, this idea of how are these different assignments of processors to nodes affecting our performance, this turned out to be really what we needed. So here's from an actual problem we had. We knew that we had some application that was really hungry for bandwidth. It really needed to use those links. And here's sort of what the, the mini maps show for that application, sort of just using the default, we didn't think about it, processor assignment. And in this case, blue means high traffic and red means low traffic. That might seem a little odd to you because usually I would make the thing that's high red. But the thing is, in this case, red is the low links because that means that there's bandwidth there that we're not <coughs> using. We need to be using all the bandwidth we can so that we can get those messages through faster so we can get back to doing science. So we looked at this and we were like, we're not even using One Direction hardly at all. This, this isn't so good. But at least we know very quickly what's going on in this particular assignment. And then very quickly, we can compare a whole bunch of assignments. So starting from this default, we tried all of these other things. And then we realized, OK, so these, this D and this E assignment, I'm just giving them those names for now, they're using the links really, really well in comparison to the others. And in fact, those were the ones that were, ran the fastest. And now you might be wondering, well, if you knew they ran fast already, why, why are you looking at this? Well, because now we understand why they ran the fastest. We can say, OK, I know what D and E were doing. I can see how they're use, utilizing the network. Now I can design other processor assignments for other applications or for other sizes of the network in order to better use these links from the get-go. So I can skip this step where I have to start off in a bad place. And I can start off in a really already good place. So this is one way that we designed a new visualization that helped us really understand what was going on in this parallel network so we could see performance improvements. So now I have another problem and another application. So why is this communication algorithm slow? So we did a bunch of work before I got to this slide that I'm not going to show here that said, OK, well, it's not the network this time. We think it has something to do with this part of the algorithm, but we really don't know why. And I can't just go to the developer and say, we think it's somewhere in here. Now it's your problem. Um, so what's happening here is we have a binary tree. Things are being sent down the binary tree. Um, we believe this is going to be sort of balanced in a way. And then in terms of data, what I'm going to have is, well, I have this communication graph that I'm showing you. This is what's going on in the software space. I know that some of those um, some of those process to process messages are going to be heavy. They're going to have a lot of bytes, and I'm going to draw those thicker and maybe colored. And I also know how long it took the processes to complete. So the ones that are more orange took longer time, and if they're taking a long time, everybody else has to wait for them. So we're not using resources as well as possible, and we're not running as fast as possible. So this is just sort of an eight eight seven process. Um, mock-up. So first we start with something small. So we throw this graph into a normal graph drawing program. And this is what we get. So 256 processes. And we can already see quite a lot's going on here. So we have this one fourth of the tree that, that's really heavy in terms of um, it's got a lot of heavy links in it. And it's got a lot of processes that take a long time to complete. So we think, yeah, there's probably some, some sort of correlation between how much is being sent and how long it's taking them to complete. So we think we have good evidence that this is what we actually want to be looking at, that we're in the right part of what's causing poor performance. But we also have all these other heavy links in other places. So they're saying, we're sending a lot of messages between these other processes, but something is not, it's, it's not as bad there some 
way. So if we take this to the developers now, they're going to say, well, this evidence is good, but we're not really sure we should, we should be putting our resources here. This was a hard algorithm to come up with. What are we going to do differently? And so, okay, we can understand there might be some noise in the system if we're dealing with such a small number of parallel processes. So instead of 256, let's try 16,000. And so we throw that in the graph drawing program again, and this is what we get. Yeah, this one didn't work out so well. I mean, I can still see that there's, there's something going on, but it's so busy, I can't see the little links anymore. And furthermore, this took me half an hour to generate um, on my desktop replacement laptop. So that means I can't really interact with it that much. I can't figure out what's going on. So we thought, okay, we need to come up with something better. And what we know is we don't actually care about what any individual process is doing. We sort of care about what's going on in aggregate in terms of how messages are being passed and who's taking a long time. So we came up with this other visualization. So this is our 256 process graph again. Um, we're drawing out this binary tree, but at a certain point we stop drawing all of the processes and we start aggregating them. And then in these arcs, which are, say, I have many processes, but I'm not going to draw them all out, we divide between what's taking a really long time and what's pretty normal. And when we divide it out that way, it becomes a lot clearer with what we wanted to see. We can now see, yes, not only do we have these thick arrows in that part of the graph that's kind of bad, we can see it's the, these chains that something have something wrong with it. We still have these stray big black arrows somewhere, so we still need to go to the bigger size. But now we actually have the visualization ability to do that. So here it is now. And you can see really clearly, OK, now I have a very, very strong argument for it is this sort of chain of dependence that's forcing these things to be late. We need to do something different here. The way the data is coming in is not working out for us. Um, now, so the only thing that's sort of left for this graph is, well, this is great if your problem starts at the top of the tree, but what if you have something going on sort of close to the bottom of the tree? Because we've aggregated all of those out. You can't really see them as much. This is a thousand nodes. Well, now that we're doing things in an aggregated way, now that we don't have to try to draw 16,000 nodes and all of their links at once, we can actually make things interactive. So we can allow people to say, well, I want to just see the area of the tree that's interesting. Show me that orange part. So we can warp this graph to show that orange part in more detail. We can give the analyst the ability to expand the parts of this graph that they're interested in to get to any process that they weren't able to see before. And now really explore this graph while still maintaining that visual, visual scalability. So this was another way that we were able to take a visualization challenge, how do I draw this really big graph? And then also figure out something that was going on on the performance side. What is wrong with this algorithm? Where should I start looking? So now I have one more example that I want to show. And this one's going to be a little bit longer. And the data is a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to go through this a little bit more slowly. Um, in, in these past two examples, the data I've collected has been what's known as profiling data and that I've aggregated a whole bunch of stuff in time. But now I'm going to switch over to tracing data. And so with tracing data, every single action that takes place, I keep it with its timestamp. So we have some sort of timeline because we have the exact time that all the actions happened. And we collect on every single process. So what is that process doing? And then for each process, we're going to have a timeline. So these bars are going to say, what function was I in at that time? What was the active function? Along this timeline, you can see where something started and where something ended. And the colors are going to kind of tell you what class of operation I was doing. In this case, I just have two classes, whether it was computing something or communicating. And every single process is going to have one of these timelines. And then, like I said before, we really want the sense of what's happening in parallel. How are these? How are these different processes interacting? So I'm going to add these lines over it. And those are going to show where the messages started and ended. So now I can see when I say I have a send call or I say I have a receive call, I know which one is actually matching with which other one. So this is commonly known as a Gantt chart. You might have seen it in um, your software engineering class. This is frequently used for project management, frequently used for industrial scheduling. Um, it's about 100 years old. And then I'd say with traces, it's been used for, for many, many decades. It's fairly intuitive. It uses the space well. 
Um, so this is sort of the standard way to visualize it. But I said there was going to be a problem, and the problem is this. That when you get a whole lot of processes at once, and you're drawing all those lines, at the end of the day, you're not going to see anything at all. So I have some options. I could remove all of these black lines. I would be able to see a lot more. Um, but I wouldn't have that idea of what, what this application is doing in parallel. I would have lost that great ability traces have that you can just see everything that happened and then go through and reconstruct what actually happened to sort of understand where you got your performance or how things didn't match up or how things did. Um, I would also then also have all of these little red and green bars which aren't going to tell me a lot. It might make a really great Christmas sweater but it's not telling me much about performance. So we came at this and we thought, okay, tracing is like half of what we do in, in measuring performance. We really want something that's gonna actually work for a large number of processes. And we wanna observe, we want to preserve these patterns, these patterns of dependencies, these messages. We still want to have the ability to explore them. So what we decided to do is switch these timelines to something called logical time because we wanted to show something about the structure. Because the first thing you might want to do when you see that trace is, what is this supposed to be telling me at all? Like, what is going on? What program am I even looking at? So our idea is, let's have this timeline show you the idealized scenario, what you think it should look like when it's working. Um, so now we're switching from this physical time, wall clock time, real time axis, to one that's in logical time. And when I say logical, like the developer logically thinks about their program. Uh, so in this example, I have these first two processes. They're doing this, these two yellow bars are sends, so you can see because the lines come out of them. These second two processes are those matching receives. So you can see that the lines go through them, they match. In physical time, due to the, the programming model used, they're going to overlap. The function calls that create the send and receive overlap. But logically, you know that a receive has to come after its matching send. It can't happen at the same time, it can't happen before. So in sort of the structured view, they're going to appear separated with the sends happening before the receives. So already I think in the small example, it's a lot easier to understand what the trace is, what the program is trying to do in the second one. Now here's a slightly bigger example. This is 32 processes. This is a real trace. Um, I did not doctor this at all to make this happen. This is legitimately what it looks like in physical time. You can see the bars are all of different sizes because this is truly what happened and not some sort of logical abstraction. When I change this to logical time, what happens is you can very quickly see what this program is trying to do. It's something pretty simple. It's just sending back and forth and back and forth. So now when I have this view, I can look at it and say, oh, I know where I am in this program. This is in this file and this function. I, I can sort of see what's going on. Now the way we get this structure, well, first we're going to start um, with an idea from distributed computing. It's called the happened before relation. Uh, it was defined by Leslie Lamport in 1978. Uh, basically, it says that on the same CPU, if I have two events, one happens after the other. The first one happened before the second one. And then between different processors, if I have a send and it's matching receive, the send happened before the receive. So you can use these two constraints to figure out sort of what the logical timeline of what actually occurred was. This is frequently used um, for debugging, especially if you're getting things out of order. You can figure out via logical time when things happen the way they weren't supposed to. Of course, that's sort of a logical time that has to do with the systems. And I've been pitching to you this idea of the logical time that has to do with the way programmers think. So I'm going to add some more constraints onto that in order to get the logical structure I'm going to show you. So if we just start with this idea of traditional logical time based on the Lamport happened before, eight process trace, we might get something like this. Um, this is also an actual trace. It's somewhat organized because, yes, I have made all of the, the function calls that would normally be of various lengths a unit length, but now they're much smaller and they're all unit length, so it looks somewhat organized, but it really doesn't tell me much at all. And part of this is because nobody I know actually does their entire program as one giant continuous logical serial idea. That's not the way we program. We program in terms of 
classes and functions, and we divide and conquer a big problem down into big phases and then smaller phases and then finally things that we can actually write in a few lines of code. So what I do is I try to find where these phase boundaries are based on various metrics inside the trace. And then once I have this phase boundary, I say, well, since we think about these separately, Probably instead of assuming one fits into the other like puzzle pieces, whenever I think about I'm starting a new coding project, I'm starting a new function, I'm thinking everything is probably in sync at the beginning of that. And because of that, we're going to break them out into this happens and completely finishes, and then the second one happens and completely finishes. So once I put that wall down, this is the logical time that I get. And so you can see from here that now something that I, I really couldn't tell any, you anything about, I can see are two iterations of the same kind of pattern. I can now see that these are the same because I put them in that sort of structure. There's a little bit more that we do at the level of the individual logical time steps. We don't have to put them as early as they possibly could be. We can say a little bit more about how we think about programming these things in parallel. And once we do that, we're actually going to get something quite structured. So now we have these, these really obvious patterns um, that, that if, you, if you work on this for a little bit, um, you should be able to lodge it something about. So when we did this, and I glossed over a lot of the details here, we didn't actually use the physical time because this is all based on these constraints that are all based on structure. So no physical time data represented. And this has been really good for us because that means like our algorithms to do this are really robust. If there's some sort of skew in the clocks <coughs> or synchronization issues on the hardware, that's not going to affect our ability to actually calculate this logical structure. On the other hand, I've been talking about performance in terms of time the whole day. I want things to run faster in real time. So the fact that we don't have any real time data makes it kind of hard to do this analysis. But fear not, we have a solution for that too. And the thing is we're going to encode some physical time data with some derived metrics. And what I mean by a derived metric is I'm going to take that raw physical time data and I'm going to calculate something based on that. And in my case, I'm going to calculate something based on both that and this logical structure that I've calculated. So what's happening here is I've got this derived metric that I call lateness. And basically lateness says, well, if I have these logical time steps, I know this whole column of things that ideally would have happened at the same time. Well, then they should also ideally take about the same amount of time and they should ideally finish at the same amount of time. So if I can say whoever finishes first, that one was on time. That one was clearly like the way things should be in my ideal scenario. And then everything else is late. It's late to the party, and I can calculate just how late it was. So back to the small example, I have these two green bars, these two receives in the first two processes. In physical time, they're quite a distance apart. The one on top is finishing way later than the one on the bottom. In logical time, they're supposed to happen at the same, wow, they're supposed to happen at the same step. So uh, this, is, this is more of a party than I thought it would be. Great. So. Um, because they're supposed to happen at the same step, what I do is I take that difference in physical time. I calculate how late the top one is. And then I'm going to encode it to a color. So what happens is this one that's laid on top, it keeps getting later over time. That's not really too surprising. And um, you see from the red color, that one is late. I know now something about the physical time that this trace captured, but I have it in the context of this logical structure that I actually understand. So here's a slightly bigger example, 16 processes. And this is an actual screen capture from the tool we have. Um, and it's showing on the top this logical structure, and on the bottom the standard Gantt chart type view that people are used to. And these are completely linked views. So if I grab one and pan on it, the other will pan the same way. So you're looking at the same thing at all times. If I click on one thing, it'll be highlighted in both views. So I can keep track of one on the other. So I use the one on top to, to figure out, well, OK, what's going on? What does this mean in terms of my code? What is my code trying to do here? And what does this also mean in terms of how late things are? And then so I might say, oh, OK, that very upper left-hand corner, there's a process that starts late. It continues to be late. Nothing ever lets it catch up. 
And not only that, as it starts interacting with the other processes, those become late. This lateness propagates because people have to wait for this late process. Processes have to wait. So I say, okay, well, I'll look at that one, and then I'll go look at the bottom and find out a little bit more detail with what's going on, try to figure out if that's something I can do something about in some sort of way. So if we go back to our problem, this guy, and we switch it to this idea of logical structure and lateness, we get something that looks like this. So this is an improvement. Um, if you zoom in, you can see that, okay, I have these definite steps. I kind of know what this parallel pattern means. Uh, so now I know what this code is doing. I can also look at the various areas where things are late. That tells me what I should be looking at immediately. So instead of sitting around and looking at that, that mess and trying to figure out, well, is something, something late or not here, we've now shown you directly, these are the things that are late. These are the things you should probably look at. However, this is also kind of really busy. It, it's hard to see. It's a little bit of an optical illusion. So we're going to use this structure once again with this idea that the patterns we see in here, we don't actually need all however many processes is, is to understand. With just a little bit, we can sort of extrapolate. So we have another view. And so on the top, that's my, that's my logical structure. But I've taken away all of the lines. Because right under it, I have this subset of timelines. So I have a subset of the processes that are sort of representative of the communication pattern that's going on. And once I understand this, it's not really too hard to look up top and say, oh, OK, I can see these general shapes. I now know what the communication pattern looks like for the thousand processes that are up there. I also have this sort of discrete nature of logical time, which allows me to cluster. So I have these two different ways that I can now deal with the fact that we don't have 100,000 rows of pixels on our screens to understand these traces, nor do we have the, the capacity to understand something that complex uh, just visually. So if I go back to this trace, I can now add some sort of view on the bottom that summarizes what the communication is doing. I have some sort of leeway on how big or how small, how much detail I want down there. So I can drop out these lines now. And it's a lot easier to read. I can just sort of see in general what the lateness patterns are. And then I can navigate using all of these linked views to figure out what exactly is going on. So I'd like to go through a case study in, in, this, in this trace regime. Um, and this is a particular big code that we run at Lawrence Livermore. We have this giant laser that we're trying to use to uh, achieve fusion. And so we also have a laser plasma simulation that we're trying to understand so we can use our laser better to, to achieve fusion. So this is run at really big scales. They will use the entire machine on this. They will do this frequently throughout the year. They would really like to see better performance. They would really like to run bigger simulations. However, we have a problem. So this is the time that it takes a single iteration, and these simulations run for lots of iterations, a single iteration to do its communication. So this is the message, messaging part. This is the exchange data part. This is not computing science. This is part of our parallel overhead. And as you can see, as we grow our simulation bigger in terms of processes, which is sort of a proxy here for in terms of how big the, the science we're modeling is, it takes longer and longer and longer to do this communication. So this is stuff that we're doing that's not science. So we would like to make that better. We looked at a trace, and let me show you the part of the trace that's really interesting. So here's about six or so time steps. Uh, the top is the logical structure view where we removed the lines because we have a sort of good idea of what's going on there from the bottom. The bottom also tells us that these strange patterns you're seeing, these gradients, that's not like some drawing artifact. That's actually the data happening there. So the fact that we get sort of the entire color bar up and down a single step, that's already like really weird. But secondly, what's really weird is after two steps, that pattern completely inverts. So I already showed you two examples where we have a process, it's late, it stays late, it keeps staying later than everybody else. This is not that happening. So right away, we were able to find the part in the trace that looked really weird and sort of look further at what this application is doing here. And it turned out this was a part of the application that had largely been ignored. It was written a long time ago, and nobody believed it could be a problem. But when we looked at it visually with the right kind of visual encoding, it really popped up that something wrong was going on. 
And it turns out we had this bad interaction between the message operations, the message function calls, and what was going on in the physics. And it kind of works like this. So if you see these first two steps, there's that little white part at the bottom. We have some round trip behavior that's going on in the messaging. So the part at the bottom, all it does is receive, it's fine. Then the one who sent to it says, okay, I, you've acknowledged me, I can now complete. And once I complete, I will do my receiving job. And then the one that sent to it says, oh, okay, finally you've received this, I can finally complete my send. And now I can do my receiving job. And then the one before it says, oh great, you finished, now I can finally complete my send and do my receive. And this happens all the way up. So these are things that logically should have all happened in one step. Everybody sent to the next person, we should be able to do this in parallel, this should be super fast. But because of the particular function calls used and the way that this was set up, we had this thing where we essentially serialized something in parallel. So we were wasting a ton of time on this communication that we didn't need to. So it's really fortunate that we were able to fix this. And once we fix this, here are the same two parts of the trace, the same exact lateness values. You see the newer trace shows much less lateness. It's going much faster. So if we return then to this graph where, okay, we were taking way too much time in communication. Now, after we fix it, flat. That means that as we grow our simulation bigger, we're just spending the same amount of time with that boring communication that's not science. We're no longer taking a ton more time. We can now spend all of our time and all of our power on the real science. So this is really great. And at the biggest scale we ran this at, this was a four times speed improvement in terms of the communication, which for us is a really big deal. 10% is a big deal. This is 400%. Um, so I think now here through my three examples, I've shown you how we take these really difficult visualization problems and also these difficult performance problems. And we sort of solve the two in tandem. Through the performance problems, we understand how to better use our visualization. Through the visualization, we understand our performance problems. I showed you this in terms of traces, making those easier to understand. I showed you this in terms of networks and processor assignment, being able to actually see the links that we wanted to see. And I showed you this in terms of a big tree communication graph, just showing you the parts of the information that you need from the data without having to show you everything. This is an area I really, really love because I think visualization is a great way to understand things better, but we have these problems of scale. But I also love computing in general, and this really gives me the ability to learn and understand more about all areas of computing while still doing sort of my core area of visualization. Um, if any of you would be interested in doing that, I'd like to therefore make my pitch for the University of Arizona, which is where I'm going in two months to start as a professor. We are always looking for really great students. Um, and I know that Sonoma State has really great students. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can find my email from um, Professor Levin or Professor Rivar, and I'd love to talk to you. So thank you so much for coming to my talk, and I'd be really, really happy to take any questions. Yes. You mentioned earlier that there was um, uh, simulations or simulations of global warming or weather. Oh, uh, climate. Yes. Yeah. Do they have those for human body? So um, one of the other pictures, uh, and it's all the way at the beginning of the talk, so I'm not going to skip there. Was actually of a human heart. And a friend of mine does this, so she's actually in biomedical engineering, and she models blood flow in, in the heart. So you have to model like, okay, your, your blood vessels are, are circles or they're, they're curves, and we don't do curves in discrete spaces so well. Um, and so that's a big parallel simulation. She recently uh, submitted something. There's this big award that we have for who's running the biggest science simulation. So I think hers is a, is a contender, and next week we'll find out how she did there. Whole body system, I'm not sure. I mean, that's a really, really big problem because, um, you know, we have like this, this network of, of circulatory system and on top of that muscles and on top of that everything. I think uh, one of the most interesting things I saw is a gentleman who was actually trying to model everything that was going on in the simplest bacteria he could find. And I already thought that was like a real big project to be doing really important science. So we're not quite to the level of the humans yet, but we're getting there piece by piece. Other questions? 
Yes, sir. What kind of challenges moving forward uh, with the five D Taurus are posed? Awesome. Okay, so five D Taurus. Um, I actually had an undergraduate working on that for me a couple of years ago, and um, what we did was we'll, like you can't even show that in, in three dimensions at all. So we looked at taking this flattening that we did. So we've taken something in three dimensions down to two dimensions. So that's helping us. And then if we bring the 3D back, the actual 5D torus that exists is more like four, two 4D torus stuck together. It's only two in one direction and that helped a bit. Uh, several other groups have been working on that too. We were able to do a very similar study. So we were against, again, looking at how we can map these these um, processes onto resources. We were, and what was actually really important in that case was if you take a group that are communicating together, you can show them on the 3D torus in any way, and that's fine. 5D, not so much. So this gave us the ability to reason about these five dimensional groups. So that was really exciting. I don't know how much longer um, that the five dimensional tori will exist in, in terms of, of the supercomputer. So right now, I think a lot of people are looking at uh, the Dragonfly network, which is a new way of, of attaching the, the resources that, that they're bringing up at um, Lawrence Berkeley. So, so look out for that too. But yes, the 5D Taurus remains a bigger problem. Yes? Uh, what drove the design, the design decision for uh, Python with yet another markup language? Um, I think with Python, we liked the idea that you could develop things really fast with it. So a lot of visualization is sort of a rapid prototyping. Uh, studies have shown that rather than taking one design and polishing it really well, starting with like five or six designs, really opening your mind to the design space can be really important. So we don't want to put a lot of um, computing difficulty in terms of... Um, in terms of getting that development. We want our students to be able to develop fast. So that's why we chose Python. Uh, we also want scientists from all over to come in. So we don't want language to be a barrier. As for YAML, um, I think we were looking for something that was short and readable. So actually only the headers in Boxfish, uh, which is the, the tool that has the Taurus visualizations in it, use YAML. The rest of it is um, tab separated values. But now we're sort of moving past that. There's a limit to that. We need to be able to like get the data in and out faster. So now we're looking at various database architectures that are going to give us the ability to, to get that data faster to you. Yes, sir. It looks like most of your, your scales are, are linear. And I, I've noticed that um, a lot of data presentations, that a linear scale is, is not appropriate. Um, it's something like Perhaps a logarithmic. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you played with that in your so so much about these scales? Um, you can adjust the range, and I think that has been the most important part, even more so than using log scale, is like, just show me the data that's in this range. I don't care about the easier range, but almost all of these have a log scale option as well. Um, so if you want to see those sort of outliers that might get hidden because you have like one, one big outlier somewhere. But yes, we, we support that as well. It's, it, you uh, discussed in a 400% improvement. Uh -huh. Did that cause in the, or was that done in the wake of discovering a flaw in the XYZT node mapping? <laughs> yeah, so there, there's a couple things that were going on there. One was the portion that I showed. There was also this resource assignment problem that they were trying to study for a particular architecture. So it was both of those together um, that got a lot of the improvement. But the graph I showed you already had that, um, already had the node mapping, or rather the resource assignment uh, appended. So I started from the baseline of we're already assigning resources in the smartest way possible. Now what can we do when we fix this problem revealed by the trace? Any more questions? Oh, thank you.